Let me also thank the organizers for a great conference. Uh, this work was done at the uh, National University of Singapore with Ted Kuniski and Stephanie Boehner. Um, and um, well, these are pictures of Bohr and Heisenberg. And this talk will be about sort of relating their uh, perspectives. So I have to give a warning, given the uh, nature of the prior talks in this conference, that there's not going to be uh, deep mathematics in this in this talk. But on the other hand, hopefully there will be some deep physics. And uh, in particular, um, I'm going to be the main message of the talk is that there's an equivalence between this so-called wave-particle duality principle and the uncertainty principle. And uh, but I, I I leave it as an invitation to you to apply your heavy mathematical tools. To, uh, to my topic. Okay. Um, so let me just start with some intuition. If you have a two-path interferometer, uh, we all know that if you shoot bullets at that interferometer, you won't see an interference pattern. But on the other hand, uh, if you shoot electrons, you, you will see, you can see interference. And this is actually a uh, real, real data set from 2013 involving a double slit electron uh, fraction. And uh, but of course, bullets are just bunches of electrons mixed in with us some other particles, so why is there a change in behavior? Um, in fact, we now know that uh, even with electrons, you can actually see this transition between interference and no interference. In this same uh, experimental paper, what they did is they had a double slit, and then they took a mask and dragged uh, the mask across the double slit so that uh, in some cases, namely in here, both slits were exposed. Um, but as they drag the mask uh, more, say it partially covered uh, one of the slits here, so the interference started to disappear. And then when, the, when they completely cover one of the slits, there's just one slit exposed, then you no longer see the interference. So you can gradually see as you uh, have just one slit exposed, and then two slits, and then back to just one slit, the transition between no interference and interference. So, so what this is telling us is that um, everything, whether it's an electron, or a bullet, or a bacterium, has the uh, possibility of exhibiting wave behavior that is producing an interference pattern. Um, and likewise, each can exhibit particle behavior that is held, have a well-defined path. Um, but, but the issue is that there's a competition between seeing uh, these two behaviors. And so why is this? You might think that um, by studying quantum mechanics, you might get the answer to this great mystery. But in fact, uh, what happens is that you never really get to understand quantum mechanics, you just get used to it. So, uh, and, and just to sort of back up my statement here, that, that anything kind of exhibits this, this wave behavior, people have even showed for large molecules, like 60 carbons or more, or bio, biological molecules, in a nice set of experiments, that you can even see wave behavior for these big molecules. Uh, and, okay, even though the behaviors themselves are mysterious, uh, we can get some intuition uh, as to why they compete in certain examples. For example, Feynman discusses this double slit experiment for electrons, and he, uh, he says, OK, suppose you have a light source behind your, your screen here, and the idea is that if a photon bounces off your electron, you can see where that photon came from, and, and then hence learn which path the, uh, the particle went on. And uh, so, but, but the problem there is that um, the, it gives a, a momentum kick to the electron, and so what happens is that the values and the interference pattern get get filled in, and so it smears out the interference pattern because of this random momentum kick. Uh, and so Feynman said, well, what if you vary the wavelength of your, of your light source so that uh, you don't give it so much momentum kick? Let's make the wavelength a little bit longer so that it carries less momentum. And, uh, and, and, and so then you can recover your interference pattern. But the problem there is that the spatial resolution of your microscope goes down. And so, so as you lengthen the wavelength, you can no longer see which path that the particle goes on. So you can see how there's a a nice uh, competition here. Uh, to get more quantitative, um, let's consider a simpler interferometer, simpler than the double slit. Uh, there's this famous interferometer for uh, single photons that uh, is named after Mach and Zender. And the idea is that the photon, photon comes in and impinges upon a beam splitter. Then you create uh, a superposition between the which path states at this point, which I'm uh, denoting as 0 and 1. And then uh, a phase is applied to the lower arm here. And then they recombine on the second beam splitter. And then finally, you measure the output mode, that is, uh, whether a detector D0 clicks or D1 clicks. And uh, we can define a measure of wave behavior uh, at, in terms of uh, the following. Basically, we look at the amplitude of the interference fringes. We, as we vary phi, what happens is that the probability to detect a particle in the top detector varies sinusoidally with 
phi, and uh, we can just basically look at the amplitude of those wiggles. Um, and that's how we define uh, fringe visibility, that's a measure of wave behavior. Likewise, we can define a measure of particle behavior by um, talking about the path predictability. How well can you predict the path that the photon goes on? Uh, I'm denoting the path observable here as, as z, and so I'm going to um, ask how well can you guess correctly which path the photon is going to go on. It's an operational measure of, of predictability, and uh, non-trivial predictability can be achieved, for example, by making the first beam splitter be asymmetric, have a higher chance for reflection than transmission, for example. Um, and sure enough, uh, it's been proven by these, these authors that, that you get a nice simple trade-off between uh, predictability and visibility. P squared plus B squared is less than or equal to 1, uh, which implies that if one term is 1, the other one must be 0. So if you have full particle behavior, then you have no wave behavior. If you have full wave behavior, there's no particle behavior. And likewise, this treats the intermediate case uh, of partial predictability nicely. Um, but uh, that, that scenario that I just talked about is sort of uh, limited because it only treats the case of prior knowledge about which path is, the photon is going to take. But it's even more interesting to talk about knowledge that you gain during your experiment. Uh, and to treat this scenario, um, these authors, Jager, Shimney, and Weidemann, and Engler introduced a measure they call path distinguishability, where um, the photon may interact with some environment, E, uh, during the experiment. For example, E could be like a gas of atoms whose internal state is sensitive to the presence of a photon. And then you can perform a measurement on E uh, to try to gain information about which path the, part the, the photon took. So uh, we can define a uh, measure, measure of path distinguishability by talking about the uh, probability to guess, guess the path correctly given the optimal measurement that you can perform on this environment system. And, and sure enough, these authors showed that you can derive rigorously this trade-off b squared plus b squared is less than or equal to 1. And, uh, and what's nice about this is that it's actually more general than the previous scenario where I talked about this p squared plus b squared relation in the sense that you can have both prior knowledge as well as knowledge that you pick up during the experiment uh, in order to uh, learn the path. So the topic of my talk is the following. Where do these relations come from? Should we just accept this, these relations as uh, sort of a fundamental aspect of quantum physics um, that's just supposed to be taken as some sort of axiom or something? Or, or should we think of these relations as some corollary of some other perhaps more basic principle, or some other more familiar principle that we're used to. Um, it's interesting, of course, one might guess that, that it's somehow related to the uncertainty principle, but Engler noted in his original paper that in his derivation of this inequality, it does not make, it use, does not make use of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in any form. And furthermore, he remarked that there's only one observable involved in, in this trade-off. In particular, he was referring to the, the path observable. But this hasn't stopped people from debating this question. Um, <clears throat> There was there actually a, uh, an intense debate in the 1990s um, involving a bunch of comments in nature, back and forth, uh, about whether um, this, these relations are somehow a consequence of the position momentum uh, uncertainty principle. And this is a very heated debate, and uh, as far as I'm aware, it didn't come to a, a clear conclusion. Um, and, uh, but I don't want to insert myself into this debate, so I'm not going to, uh, to answer that question. On the other hand, um, I'm going to ask a slightly different question, um, which is whether these relations are somehow a consequence of the uncertainty principle for qubits. Uh, after all, um, interferometers, the two-path interferometer is like a two-state system, so it seems reasonable to guess that maybe these are somehow a consequence of qubit uncertainty. Yeah. Yes? Why the debate? after you know, this, this whole debate occurred, um, ha have showed that by considering Robert's uncertainty relation, they were able to derive the p squared plus p squared relation. And these, these papers here talk 
talk about this in detail. Namely, they considered the following qubit observables. Here's the visibility observable. Um, and uh, so they considered a qubit uh, with two complementary observables, like orthogonal axes on the block sphere. Um, they identified the predictability with sigma z and the visibility with some uh, observable in the xy plane. And then uh, you can just sort of go through the math and compute the, the variance of the predictability observable, the variance of the visibility observable, and then plug these into the Robertson and Cerny relation, and then rearrange uh, this formula here, and you'll get out that p squared plus b squared is less than equal to 1. So, so what's nice about this is we see that, um, indeed, we can understand uh, p squared plus b squared less than equal to 1 as a consequence or an equivalence to the Robertson and Cerny relation for certain few observables. But, but still, what about this other uh, more interesting relation involving the, the distinguishability? Um, what's a little strange about this is it involves um, conditioning on some other system here, E. And, uh, well, uh, uh, standard deviations are a little bit clunky when it comes to conditioning on things, but, but entropies are very natural quantities to condition on some background or side information. So, so you know, you might guess, well, maybe this B squared plus B squared relation is somehow related to the entropic uncertainty principle. Uh, before I get to that, uh, I just want to revisit the p squared plus v squared relation and ask whether that relation can be understood as a consequence of the entropic uncertainty principle. Um, this question was looked at um, in 2013 by these authors. They considered a particular form of the entropic uncertainty relation involving rainy entropies. This, these rainy entropies are a family of measures that are parameterized by a single parameter q, which is an exponent here. And uh, they considered uncertainty relations of the form HQ of P plus HQ of B is greater than or equal to some bound. Don't worry about the form of the bound. Um, but what they argued is actually that, that they're inequivalent, that this fam whole family of, of, measure, of uh, uncertainty relations is actually inequivalent to P squared plus P squared uh, less than or equal to 1. Um, so, but these, this family is actually not the most general, or it doesn't call, cover all examples of, an, of a trauma uncertainty relation that we know. Um, and in fact, the original paper, the famous paper by Moss and Nofink, actually proved an entropic uncertainty relation involving rainy entropies where you use a different rainy entropy for the different terms. Namely, uh, for example, you can choose um, the first term to have q equals infinity, the second term to have q equals one half, and they prove this relation. And our first result is to show that this inequality is actually equivalent to the, to the p squared plus p squared uh, relation. So, um, and I'm not going to go through the proof of these formulas, but if you just sort of accept these formulas as, as true, you can, you can plug in this, these formulas for, uh, into, uh, for uh, h infinity of b and h one half of b into this relation, and indeed recover p, p squared plus p squared less than equal to 1. Actually, it turns out that the top formula is very interesting, or it's very um, easy to show because uh, it just involves the, the guessing probability, whereas the, the second relation is actually more difficult to show. Um, but, uh, okay, so we, sh we showed that, that this relation is equivalent to a rainy entropy and certainty relation. Um, it, it, this also implies, of course, that there's some relationship between this rainy and certainty relation and Robert and certainty relation, Robert and certainty relation, but I won't get into that. Um, before I move on to this more interesting relation, I just want to apologize that I'm going to switch notations because in the, uh, in, um, it turns out that these infinity and one-half rainy entropies are so useful in quantum information theory that they've been given different names. They're called the min entropy and the max entropy, actually. You heard about this in the previous talk. Um, and uh, so I'm going to switch to min and max for infinity and one-half. I just want to step back from the math for a moment and give the overview of the goal of this work. Uh, so the idea is that we're trying to unify a vast literature on wave particle duality relations. So in addition to the ones that I showed you already, there's other relations for more complicated interferometer settings, like involving asymmetric beam splitters, quantum beam splitters, polarization dynamics, or quantum erasure. And we want to bring these relations together and say that they're a consequence of a single inequality. In particular, that inequality is going to be an entropic uncertainty relation involving the min and max entropy. So so we're also showing an equivalence between wave particle duality and, and entropic uncertainty. Um, and this also, as, as a consequence, provides um, a rigorous framework now to discuss wave particle duality um, relations and, uh, and to, to derive them. It turns out that 
entropy, entropic circulations are really easy to work with. You can just um, condition on systems very easily. So it's, it's a very natural way to frame wave particle duality. And, and as an example, we end up uh, formulating a new wave particle duality relation for an exotic scenario involving a quantum beam splitter. Um, and the last point I'm, I'm going to emphasize is that there is a distinction, actually, as we heard about in the previous talk, between preparation uncertainty and measurement uncertainty. And uh, this actually gives rise to two different classes of wave particle duality relations, where you, in one case, you're talking about preparation, in another case, you're talking about measurement uncertainty. So the main result of our work is that um, is the following. We identify uh, for a two-path interferometer for single particles or single quanton. Um, we identify the particle behavior and wave behavior with the availability of a certain kind of information, uh, namely information about some qubit observable. Uh, in the case, and we think of these qubit observables as orthogonal axes on the block sphere. So we identify particle behavior with the, the mean entropy of the Z observable, given access to some other quantum system J. J is just, just some general quantum system. For example, it could be a, a, a which way detector. Um, and likewise, I identify the lack of wave behavior with the max entropy of W given K, where W is some axis, some axis in the XY plane of the block sphere. And again, K is just some arbitrary quantum system, which might help you in uh, predicting the, uh, in, in seeing the wave behavior. Um, so, so our general result is that um, the sum of the uh, so the lack of particle behavior plus the lack of wave behavior is lower bounded by one bit of information. And what's what's interesting here is that actually well one of the interesting things is that um, this inequality has actually been used to prove the security of quantum field distribution. So this kind of brings up an interesting question: Do wave particle duality relations actually have some application? In, uh, in quantum key distribution. Um, so let me uh, revisit this d squared plus b squared uh, less than or equal to 1 inequality now, uh, but from the entropic perspective, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, this, uh, this, this predictability visibility relation is equivalent to this relation here. Um, and to get, the, to get the, the distinguishability relation, all we have to do is condition on system E here. So that is, um, the particle uh, at time t1 interacts with an environment, and then we apply the uncertainty relation at this time after it's interacted with the environment, time p2, and, uh, and that's how we recover this. And the derivation, I won't go through, but it's related to the fact, for example, that the min entropy is, uh, has been given an operational meaning in terms of the probability of guessing correctly given that you can perform the optimal measurement on the conditioning system. And so it has this very direct relationship to the distinguishability. And then this relation requires some effort to prove. Um, but you plug in those relations, and you get the desired result. Now I'm just going to remark that to, to, to derive those relations, what we did is we applied the preparation uncertainty relation at this time p2 after the system is interacting with the environment. Um, and so what these preparation uncertainty relations do as discussed in the previous talk, is they tell you how well you can predict the outcome of future measurements. So, so to measure like distinguishability, what Alice would do is she would remove the second beam splitter, and then she would ask how well can she predict which detector is going to click. Uh, but there's a different kind of scenario, a different kind of guessing game, where you're trying, instead of to predict, you're trying to retrodict. Uh, that is, given, um, like suppose Alice, is, Alice fixes her measurement apparatus, and we want to know how well can Alice's apparatus um, retrodict what state was fed into the input of the interferometer. So, namely, uh, we can imagine that uh, Alice and Bob are playing a guessing game. Bob flips, flips a coin. If he gets heads, Bob will block the top arm uh, of the interferometer. If he gets tails, he'll block the bottom arm. And Alice's job is to guess whether he got heads or tails, given that she has access to the environment and also she knows which detector clicks. So this is a retrodictive problem. Um, she's trying to guess whether he fed in the zero or the one state. Or likewise, you can formulate the similar guessing game with the complementary observable where Bob is either applying no phase or he's apply applying a phase of pi to the bottom arm. And Alice is trying to guess which phase. So, so there's this, so we can define um, distinguishability and visibility to distinguish them, distinguish, sorry, then from the, my other measures, I use 
the names output distinguishability and output visibility, whereas in the measurement scenario, I give them the names input distinguishability and input visibility. Um, and hopefully, the difference in the scenarios should be clear. Uh, one case, I'm talking about prediction. The other case, I'm talking about retrodiction. OK. And, and, and the idea is that we get two different classes of wave particle duality relations. This one, which is the class originally talked about by Angler, and then this sort of different new class of measurement wave particle duality relations involving the input distinguishability and input visibility. Um, OK, this is the final application. I'll mention that we considered this sort of exotic scenario that's, that's received a lot of hype in the literature lately um, involving a quantum beam splitter. And the idea here is that you can use the polarization of the photon to control whether or not the second beam splitter appears in the path of the photon. So if the polarization is H, horizontal, then um, the, the beam splitter is not in the path. If the polarization is V, then the beam splitter is in the path. So if you feed in a superposition of H and V, then the beam splitter is in a superposition of being absent and present. Or in other words, the interferometer is in a superposition of being open and closed. So uh, this, this uh, quantum beam splitter has received attention due because it allows for a delayed choice experiment. Um, and, and you can apply the standard sort of, um, well, you can apply like our measurement uncertainty relation uh, to this scenario and derive something like this and then show that actually input visibility is equal to the output visibility in this case, and, and you get this result. And this kind of relation was tested experimentally in this science, recent science paper, and they plotted uh, visibility and distinguishability and, and uh, squares in their sums. Um, actually, just as an interesting anecdote, um, I noticed that whenever I tried to theoretically predict their curves for their experiment, my theoretical predictions um, differed dramatically from their experiment. And uh, but on the other hand, I noticed that if I plotted the visibility and distinguishability without squaring them, that it looked exactly like what they plotted. And I emailed the authors of the paper, and sure enough, they said that they actually plotted the visibility and distinguishability as opposed to their squares in their plot. But, but, what, but that, this has a consequence, because actually, if you look at their relation, it looks really tight here that the sum of the squares is, is equal to 1. But actually, in reality, it's, it's not tight. It looks more like this. And so there's room for improvement. What I'm trying to say, and namely, um, if, if we using our framework, we can sort of improve the relation from, from this to uh, to this, something that's perfectly tight uh, for all values of alpha, which determines the degree of the superposition. And uh, and the way we get this tightness is just by conditioning on P the final polarization of the photon after it exits the interferometer. Um, there's another benefit of this kind of relation because it turns out that um, the previous relation uh, doesn't actually depend on the coherence of the beam splitter. It can be stimulated just by uh, a classical mixture. So, but, but in our relation, it is sensitive to coherence. So measuring quantities in our relation allows you to sort of witness the coherence of the beam splitter. Um, OK, just to make my final remarks. Um, so we've shown that, that wave particle duality relations in the tropical are actually entropic uncertainty relations in disguise, um, uh, namely the uncertainty relation involving the min and max entropies. And this sort of raises an interesting question as to whether wave particle duality relations have some application in, in cryptography or when appropriately formulated. Uh, and uh, all of our, but, but all of our wave particle duality relations can be um, hold if you replace these entropies with the, the well-known von Neumann entropy. So if you're interested in investigating a uh, different class of relations, you can always put in the von Neumann entropy. Um, and uh, our framework um, points out that there's two different classes of uh, wave particle duality relations involving preparation and measurement uncertainty. And, uh, and, and it makes it obvious how to derive new relations just by applying the tropic uncertainty relations to, to sort of exotic interferometer models. And we did this for the quantum beam splitter. Um, and I should mention that our framework only applies thus far to uh, two-path interferometers for single particles. And it would be really interesting to extend this framework or this connection between wave particle duality and tropical uncertainty to the more general scenario where we have multiple photons or multiple paths. So with that, I'll say thank you for listening.